So I'm really excited about the video I got for you guys today. Shout out DJ Burn One for taking the time to have a conversation with me and dropping a bunch of gems. Uh, we covered everything from the value in networking and pulling up to studio sessions, how you can provide value so you can become a regular in those sessions and what that meant for him and how he got involved with TI and Grand Hustle to the point that TI actually ended up doing some of the DJ drops for one of his first tapes he put out. Uh, knowing your legal rights as a producer and how you can protect your work. Just a bunch of other gems, everything from how to stay motivated, inspired, and creative and just get out of your comfort zone. So check it out. And I know you guys are going to enjoy it. So like I said, I think a lot of value is in like just helping people really, especially just like talking through your experiences with it to understand like, not to say it can't be done, but a lot of the best connections you're going to make. Um meeting people that'll help you elevate your own music and inspire you and shit really happens like in person so like when was uh when was the first time like you started pulling up studio sessions was it in atlanta or like what were those like yeah i was in high school um and i just happened to go to school with these two girls who were in a group named ecstasy they were like the grade above me and uh, they were signed to ti at the time so i've been doing mixtapes and stuff okay and um every day i would get out i'd get off of school and like like drive around the city in my dad's little red pickup truck and drop mixtapes off for consignment you know so yeah, i yeah. drop them off and i go back and pick them up you know a couple of days later talk to the cd store owners and stuff anyway so i started doing okay and i asked them i was like yo can uh y'all get ti to do some drops we all do some drops so i got like ti and the whole grant hustle to, like host one of my first mixtapes when i was like 11th or 12th grade oh. um which was pretty dope you know it's definitely like a stamp kind of like legitimized it you know um but through that, I started following through Grant Hustle, um, their studio. And so they had a bunch of artists recording, a bunch of people engineering and stuff. And uh, shit, I just started coming around. I was like, shit, you know, like that gave me the door to work with other artists up there. Hell you yeah. Know? And so from that, you know, there's a guy I used to see around all the time. Well, it was cool. It was a cool experience, period, because that's how I learned, you know, saw my first Pro Tools session. You know, I remember like looking at the screen and being like, "Ask some big country king." I was like, "What are all those colors right there?" He was like, "That green one a snare, man. That, <laughs> that blue one a kick." I was like, "I don't know none of these terms." I was like, "I don't know what none of this shit is." You know, like, yeah, yeah. Fan of music, I didn't know how none of it worked. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, so he showed me that. And anyways, this guy was used to come around because like I did big country stuff first, and then. Uh, this guy was just so funny. I'm like, this dude is hilarious. He'd come with this like crate full of notebooks with just bars, you know? And he was just funny, just rapping his ass off. And uh, his name was Young Dro. And so I did his first project and um, like his first mixtape. And it was funny because the mixtape came out right the same day, uh, or like the same week that Shodalin got added to radio. You know, like they just yeah. happened to coincide. Like I just happened. And I was like grabbing scraps from him. Like I went to the studio for like a whole month. And we'd just sit there and wait for him to show up. He would come. I'd have some beats, just like other people's beats. I wasn't producing then. So it'd be like random instrumentals and stuff, like the Jay-Z and Linkin Park. I gave him that one. He killed that shit. I gave him like an 8-Ball MJG beat. Um, but I would just bring him different beats that I'd want to hear him on, you know? You weren't and even I, producing at the time. Nah, nah, yeah. And I was just giving him instrumentals, you know? like Yeah. Just off wanting good music to be made. Songs that were already out, yeah. Just like, I just want to hear some dope shit, you know? Like, you'd be rapping people would want to hear this shit, you know? Because I was oh, just yeah. kind of, yeah. like, a bit entertaining to me, or I think it's funny, or I think it's, you know? Like, I thought Gucci Mane was funny when I met him. I'm like, this is a funny dude. Like, clearly a hard worker, clearly a lot going on, but he's dope, and I'm entertained, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah but man. it all happened just because, you know, like, I knew Ecstasy. Like, that got me in the door to be able to go to Grand Hustle and be around people and just show my face, you know? It's like, exactly. you, gotta have, you gotta have a reason to be around, you know? I always say, I always tell people, make yourself useful. You don't know what to do? Make yourself useful. Show up with some fucking donuts. You know what I'm saying? Ask people if they need something. You know, like, just do the, you know what I'm saying? Do the do boy work. Do do whatever you can do. You know, like, I remember just to get around some of my favorite people, I did a hip hop DVD called The Fix. And so I went around, I didn't know how to shoot nothing. You know, it's like, I went around and shot a whole hip hop DVD back when hip hop DVDs were a thing like Smack and all that. Like, going around and interviewing DJ Toon for an hour on his whole history. You know, like, interviewing these different people and just bringing the camera and sitting with them and talking. And I put it out, you know, it was dope and everything. And everybody's glad to be a part of it. That got me a door back in. So next time I was in the area, I was like, Toon, you know, I was in the West End. We had the spot yeah. in the West End. You know, Toon, I'm in the area. He's like, oh, yeah, the dude, the DJ, who's was the camera guy and shit. Yeah, come through. He was cool. You know, show up with some weed, 
whatever, you know, a little Hell drink. Yeah. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like some some kind of gift, you know? It's like, don't come empty handed and just be like, give to me, mentor me, do this. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Let me play beats or something like that. Yeah, you gotta let things naturally roll into a, you know, like mm-hmm. every relationship I have has just been natural. You know, just seeing somebody and be like, oh, I like your work or I like how you do things or something, you know, like, how can I help you? I always try to provide value before I ask for anything. And most of the time, I'm not going to provide value to get something out of that person, you know? But if people see somebody being useful, they're like, oh, yeah, I saw you do this for this person, you know? So. Yeah, it's giving without having an expectation that shit be in return. Just, like, putting out that good energy and whatever happens, happens. Exactly. Yeah, bro. Exactly. Facts. You just have to put yourself out there, you know? Even with, you know, online stuff now, it's like, there's so many events, like, I standard and different things. Like, Illmind, I know he does the, has the ox cord. Yeah, I always feel like you can measure somebody by how they treat someone who can't do shit for him. You know, it's like not like you can't do shit for him, but you know what I'm saying. Like just in general, you know, like at the time, like I couldn't really, I wasn't really doing anything specifically for Ti. You know, it's like he was way bigger. His trap music was just about to come out like a couple months after my project. You know, so it's like it wasn't like he needed to do it. But he just did it. Hell you know? yeah. yeah. I've always seen like even just watching him move. Like when he walks into a room, I've just seen him kind of like bow to people. You know. And it's like they treat him like a king afterwards. You know, it's like if you want to be treated like royalty, treat other people like royalty. You know, it's like it's really that simple. You know, I think people try to find like cheat codes and short, you know, it's like trying to like spam this and do that and all these like they try to like, oh, I'm going to figure out how to get this shit done by doing, you know, like, uh, I don't know, I'm going to use keywords and do this and do something, you know, and it's like just be a good person, make dope shit, go meet people. You know what I'm saying? Like Dave Pensado just came came in town uh, for some IMSTA InstaFest, InstaFest or something like that. Some uh, audio audio thing was down at the SAE school. I'm like, fuck! I've watched Pensado's place. Fuck! I watched every episode twice. You know? Mm-hmm. I'm like, fuck! Down. I went up just and met him, talked to him. I asked him, you know, a question about uh, balance and something else. You know? And he gave me so much game. Just went and met him. You know what I'm saying? He's there. Like people are around. You know? It's like, but I was just like. Showing love and being cool first. I feel like that's why I got that response. He was good everybody. You know? He's just a dope person. Hell but, yeah. You know, it's like, don't look, for, don't look for cheat codes. I was still artists and just people in general. You know, there's no elevators. You got to take the stairs, you know? What you think, um, like, I mean, it don't even have to be anything specific, but like any lessons you've learned or advice you give to people on like protecting themselves in the sense of like, whether you're in a studio giving an artist a beat, sending out beats or whatever like just not to get like caught up in shit and and just be like you know screwed out on contracts or whatever if there is no contract in place shit's always gonna happen it's just a music business you know it's like the nature of the beast it's just gonna happen but just stay on top of your business and handle it sooner than later you know don't let shit ride thinking it's gonna get better because there's only a window of like seven years to handle the business on everything and then it's a wrap you know and even if you're getting a splits dispute that only has like two years to resolve before that money goes into a black box, you know, the black box thing. So it's like, always resolve your stuff immediately. You know, like I let my ASAP Rocky placements just go thinking things would be handled accordingly at some point and then seven years creeps up, you know? So it's like, had I been on my shit and just more, you know, mm-hmm. and cool being like, oh yeah, we'll work on some albums in the future and shit like that. So I always just handle your business at, at the time of it going down. You know, like if somebody calls you and say, you know, yo, you got a placement with this. Be like, okay, cool. Who's the A&R? Who's the person handling the business? Who's the, you know, who's the lawyer? I can get my lawyer in contact with their lawyer, get them going and start talking. Like, be be on top of the shit. Be a go-getter with it. Because nobody's going to handle your business for you. That's you know? Right. And nobody's in a rush to pay you either. So, if you want your money, if you want all your chips, if you want all your percents, if you want all, you know, everything that you're supposed to get, just stay on top of your business, you know? If you're in a room with people who you've never worked with before, y'all should definitely do splits on whatever the songs y'all are doing in the moment. You know, something that everybody agrees to in the moment. It's written. Everybody has a copy of that. You know, there's like online apps and stuff now that you can do it. Definitely do that. Um, you know, my crew and my people, you know, anybody who plays on it, we just equally split it. You know, so anybody, whether it be it's like home team, because I got three people I produce with, Walt Lab, Gilbert Deco, and Anna Valena, um, that I produce pretty much everything with. And then a couple other co collaborators like people that play flutes and different instruments and stuff um we just put it down the middle you know it's like we just work it out um i don't really know how it's going 
Yeah, no, that's a good answer, bro. And honestly, like, I figured doing this video, I was going to learn as much as, like, anybody watching my... I had no idea about that seven years thing at all. Because I was told by some people that are honestly pretty successful, like, just let it roll. The more money that piles up, the more money you can go get potentially in litigation, da-da-da. So you're saying there's, like, a fixed window in that shit. Fuck yeah, it's like a statute of limitations on it, you know? And it's like, if that if it's not claimed or if it's not resolved... Cause that's what I was told about that shit, you know. They're like it was a seven-year window, and like right when I started pursuing it, it was like right around that time. So it was too late in the game. So I just tell people just stay on top of your stuff and learn. You know, there's some basics, and there's a lot of different resources out there. Um, go learn the basics of just business, splits, publishing, royalty points, the different kind of ways you get paid. Um, you know, what's a what's a songwriter? Um, you know, a publishing rights organization. You know, BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. just understand you know like if you want to do if you want to be in the music business you know if you just want to make music and put on SoundCloud and don't care you know or just you know just do it for a hobby you know that's fine but if you're trying to you know be in the music business and and be in it um, I think just making yourself aware of certain things is is key because even if you get a lawyer how do you know they're looking out for your best interest it's just always better to handle shit at the time you know and it's like you have to know when to rock the boat when not. Like, you probably seen me like go ham on audio companies or labels or whoever, you know, like on Twitter or on Instagram or social media, you know, like I don't have the problem rocking the boat or calling a name or something if something's like really egregious and fucked up and bad, you know? Yeah, we just want to be compensated for our time. Thanks. You know? It's like really nothing more, nothing less. If I do some work, just pay me for it, you know? It's like I don't want to see you doing shows off my songs and then we're not getting anything, you know? Like DJ Toomps proposed the Davis Act, which would basically mean if an artist is performing a song that a producer um, co-wrote on, that a, the producer would get a percentage of that show, you know? Mm-hmm. Say, you know, I don't know, it's almost like getting a royalty rate off the performances, because these songs are being performed, and the artist can continue to perform that forever. Producer, they get like a one-time check, and then you get like residuals from royalties, but that's... You know, the live performance video, I think, is somewhere that could be explored a lot, you know? Because it's like the money moves around, you know? Sometimes it's in CDs, sometimes it's in concerts, sometimes it's wherever, you know? And it's like, producers are just trying to make a living, you know? It's like it's easy for It's It's not easy, but once an artist gets going, it's easy for artists to go to a show and make a bunch of money. It's where producers don't really have that avenue, you know? Do you see additional value in, like, collaborating in person with people versus like obviously a lot of people just collabing online now and like just building chemistry and like leveling up you know by being with somebody that complements your skill set i mean i guess it plays right into you and the five points bakery right y'all are all in atlanta yeah absolutely yeah it's um it's dope it's it's just totally different being in person because i feel like just period you know whether you're working with different producers or you're working with artists making songs just have, being in person and having that energy is why things are special. Having that energy, having that, you know, everybody being in alignment. Or if there's a tweak, everybody can be there to tweak it and figure it out at the spot. You know what I'm saying? It's not something that you get back to. Like, what do they do right here? You know what I'm saying? Like, you could just sit there and be like, oh, what if it went this way instead of that way? Or, you know, it's like, I feel like that's why great, so much great music was made before because it was a complete collaborative effort. You know? It's mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. Quincy sometimes... Quincy Jones sometimes would have parts written and then sometimes people would improve upon them and do their own thing, you know? They left room for that, you know? This shit just uh, wasn't back and forth over an email. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know? Whatever floats your boat, whatever you like, you know? But just being a person, like, I just know this all together with, with uh, my Five Points Bakery crew, like, together we just go crazy, you know? There's, like, an energy of, like, everybody's invincible and it's just, like, whoever's, you know, Whoever's adding sounds, like, they got the rock. You know, everybody's got the high hand. And it's just like, I don't know. It's dope. Like, you just feed off the energy and vibe. Hell yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's like, you know, Ricky's got so many pedals and stuff. And we got so many different pedals and different things. It's like sometimes one person can't control that at the same time. So Ricky might be playing guitar and I'm messing with the pedals. You know what I'm saying? Changing things on the fly. Or, you know, Walt's playing sax through the pedals. And I'm, you know, mm-hmm. or, you know, anything. But it's like, it's just always pushing each other to like do something different, try something interesting, you know, like be as creative as possible, just really for the whole purpose of coming up with new sounds, you know, like we're all just sound explorers, you know, sonic explorers, like 
we're just trying to find these sound, these sounds and tones. Like we were in the studio with um, Big Boy and Sleepy Brown the other day, and CeeLo. It was pretty dope. But we we're playing on some beats, and they were just like, you know, really digging the sounds and, you know, just everything. Like <clears throat> I told them, you know, like they raised us. You know, like listening to a Plymouth now, you can listen to that record. We've heard it a thousand times. You can listen to it, and on the one thousand and one time, you'll find one thing. You know, a triangle or fucking, you know, like some weird little percussion mm -hmm. instrument guitar lick or something that you just never noticed before because it's so intricate and there's so many details and things that just happen one time in a song you know so we're always trying to strive and to have that um that that interest you know like ricky ricky says our sound is foreign to the ear but familiar to the spirit you know so you feel like cool fucking motto <laughs> yeah so you thought you've heard it before but you have you know it's just got like this carries a certain thing so yeah, it's, it's just different, man. I always tell people collaborate, you know, try doing stuff with different people and just see what happens, you know. Like we work with DJ Tone and different people, and it's just like it's just different being on the spot and just sending somebody something, you know. Like sending stuff is cool. Like we do original samples for producers too, where we'll do packs. Like most people give them out for sale. I think we're about to have one out for sale here in this next week, our first public pack. But we just been sending them to producers. But that's how we got our last two placements. Um, Jadena Tribe. We co-produced that, and then um, the Lil Durk and Nicki Minaj, Extravagant, on Lil Durk's new project, we produced that too, or oh, co-produced yeah. that. And both those were for samples, um, original samples that we had sent to the producers, and they flipped. Uh, and they flipped them and, you know, through their network got in place. Um, and, you know, now we're part of their song. So it can happen anyway, you know, but I just love being in the studio, man. It's like, you'll just do some shit you'll never think about. Everybody's minds. I feel like even listening to Dr. Dre's old stuff, just like he had so many of the right people in the room that whack shit, just there was no room for it. You know, it's like it immediately, anything that was just not the fire, you know, it's like, oh, we don't need that. You know, we don't need this or whatever, you know. Because a lot of times it's like, it's what you don't need, you know. Like, so many sounds and stuff. Like, I listen to Missy Elliott talk, or Tim Lynn was talking about Missy Elliott, I watched his master class, and he was like, they would work forever to find that one loop or that one main groove, and then he would add sounds, and she would just be like, take that shit out, take that shit out. Like, every sound he was adding, like, after the main initial idea was done, she would be like, take that shit out. Because she was already going to do, like, the big different vocal throws and reverse mm -hmm. things and all that interesting stuff. And if the melody, you know, if it's too much, you know, it's like, it's just too much, you know? So like that's something I've been trying to find more too, is just the balance and the spacing. And Another reason it's good to work in person. It's great. Fast. It's great. Fast. Some artists like really sparse things, and if they hear one instrument that just is doing too much melodically, they just won't even fuck with the whole beat. Mm -hmm. You know, where yeah. if you're in the studio, the same person would be like, "Oh yeah, mute that for a minute," and then they, you know they might rap and be like, "Oh yeah, that does sound better." You know, mm -hmm. two seconds. You know, but if you don't have that, that in person rapport. But we're in the internet age, so it's like you got to do both. You know, you can't really live in one world or the other. That's I would love to collaborate with everyone in person. It's just not realistic. Whatever your goals or whatever your vision is, you know, follow that. You know, like I don't think be selling online is for everybody. Just like nothing is for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like what do you want to do? What are you trying to get out of things? You know, I mean, if you're trying to get your name out there, you need to be everywhere. You know, you need to have your beats on all the all the beat websites. And, you know, have stuff uploaded to TuneCore or Empire or wherever, you know, like all on iTunes and stuff. Like, you need to be everywhere, everywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. In person, too, pulling up any sessions you can for real. Yeah, exactly. There's stuff happening everywhere now, you know. So. Especially in a major, like, people tell me, like, they're trying to make connections and they live in L.A. I'm like, dude, if I was in L.A., I would literally be cold calling, knocking on doors. Like, can I get y'all coffee? Can I wash your car? Can I do anything just to be in the room? <laughs> Like you were talking about earlier. Yeah, man. Yeah. So definitely got to get out and meet people. Just get face to face and, you know, get out of your comfort zone. It's like you were saying before we started, like, you have to get out of your comfort zone. Like, I don't like when things start feeling too easy to me. That's why I took, when I started making beats, I just took a whole year off. I was like, nothing was inspiring me at the time. So I was like, I'm just going to learn how to make beats. So I took a whole year off and made like five beats every day. Every day I made five beats. And I was like, I'm not gonna play these for nobody. And um, after that, like after maybe a year, even after that, I just didn't want to sample anymore. 
You know, it just felt too easy. I know it's, I know it's the back of hip hop and everything, but it was just feeling too easy. I was like, I, what really interested me was trying to figure out how to make samples that gave you that feeling, like the stuff I was sampling, mm-hmm. Billy Touch, Curtis Mayfield, or anything, you know? It's like, what is Alan Parsons? What are they doing to get these, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, figuring out in our own way how to do our own version of something that just has, you know, like not hearkening back to the time specifically, but just nostalgic, period, where you just feel like, damn, that shit just grabs me, you know? It's like, dope music just grabs you, you know? So. That was why I just stopped. I, I, I pretty much just stopped sampling and got with Walt and Ricky, um, the professor at the time. And we just got in for like four or five days out of the week, every week, for like 15 hours a day, we'd get in and just go, all right, this is like three years straight. <laughs> you know, that was like our introduction to working together. Just like every day in there, just banging out 